JF Stretford Paddock. This is the one-on-one -on -one interview. And joining me is Jonas Yeva, who's a journalist based here in Norway. He's an Norwegian journalist. He's also one of the founders of Norway's biggest La Liga podcast, La Liga Loco. Jonah, it's great to see you again. It's been a little while, hasn't it, since we last spoke? It has been a while. I mean, I'm glad to see you guys. You keep returning to Norway now. I mean, with all these preseason friendlies and such uh, happening, I'm happy to see you guys always returning. Yeah. Um, also, it's warm here. This is. I've been on the tour with United following them around. Like, this is the warmest place I've been to, Norway. I didn't see that one coming, but the weather's lovely. It is. I mean, it, and it's kind of strange because the weather's been quite horrible for the past couple of weeks. So you're coming at a, at a right time, both for good football and for good weather. Jonas, we'll get into some of the, the transfer stories. The, the main, the obvious one. Um, and I'm sure you're sick of talking about it, sick of hearing about it, sick of writing about it. I've seen you, you've, you've been reporting on it since day one. Frankie yeah. de Jong, wh what is the latest update? And this could change by the time you guys are watching this, yeah. but what's the latest on the Frankie de Jong situation? I think that's interesting to point out that this could change at any, any given second. I mean, there isn't that much news to report on there because there isn't that much stuff happening. What, what we do know is that there's a standoff between Barcelona and Frankie de Jong. There is a, a sense of deferred payment that they're talking about, that obviously Barcelona being in the financial crisis that they have been and still are, have deferred payments for the young during the period in which it was worse. I mean, this is going to be, if this is going to be a, a short and sweet uh, explanation to it, that, that short explanation has to be almost 20, 30 minutes because there's so many things that we can base upon this. Frankie de Jong obviously had a huge salary once Barcelona went into COVID. You got to remember, Barcelona was one of the first clubs that were they were on course to having one one billion euros in revenue and their wage structure was therefore quite high obviously once covid hit they did not get that income in that they had sort of arranged for or planned for with the likes of the young so instead of having him take a reduced payment on a permanent basis they deferred his payments meaning that they said fine you'll take a wage cut now and we'll pay you in an iou later on the interesting part here is that that is from the previous board that was led by Bartomeu. Now it is Laporta, who you keep seeing talking about Frankie de Jong and talking to you. We've all seen his, 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 uh, his interviews and such, talking about how players need to take wage cuts in order to help Barcelona and how he signed Rafinha and Lewandowski and saying that Barcelona are back. That's the new president. He's stating to de Jong that, look, the deal that you had was with the previous board. We are setting an internal wage structure which, in which you don't fit in at the moment. But de Jong is saying, well, that's all good and well. But I, you still earn me or owe me money. I still have to get that 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 uh, amount of money, which I believe is reported to be 60 million euros, 60 million pounds, something along those lines. And Barcelona is saying, look, either you reduce your payment or you leave. And Frankie Young is saying, well, what if I just stay and I don't do anything? I have a contract. So the standoff is between uh, Barcelona and Frankie De Young, and I believe the sense here is that if De Young agrees to move, he also waives the deferred payment because you're breaking your contract. And if you break your contract, you also break the agreements of the contract, one of those agreements being deferred payment. And this is where I believe a lot of the standoff is in terms of wages, in terms of relation between De Jong and Barcelona. But what a lot of people are saying is that obviously Manchester United could just take that payment. They can just pay De Jong in a sign-on fee or they could pay in wages over the course of five years to uh, add up to those 60 million that is deferred payment. The fact is, De Jong is not interested in doing that because it seems like he's quite happy at being in Barcelona and quite happy at the situation. But what happens when Xavi stops playing him, starts playing him as a centre-back, starts saying that perhaps he needs to go in order to free up uh, wage structure? And what happens at Barcelona once they try to register Rafinha, Lewandowski, Kessier, Christensen, Koundé, who they just signed? Because the fact and, and the issue is not with buying players, it's registering these players. Because in... We have the financial fair play in, in UEFA, which you all know, which is reactive. So you obviously you, you, you fail on the, on the financial fair play and you get a penalty in, in reactionary sense. So for the next season, you, you get a penalty. In La Liga, it's proactive, meaning that you're not able to register the player if you cannot you know, find, find means within what is called the masa salarial, which is basically the wage limit. And at the moment, Barcelona are not able to register players because they're obviously over the wage bill. That's why they're also using these levers in order to free up wage space, in order to get people in. The thing is that they've already used two of those. They have, through a board meeting, been able to um, at least, I suppose they've been able to, to have three options. So they have used two of those three options. They don't want to use the third, but they have said that they will be able to do so and then they'll be able to register the young and every other player as well. But that is, in case of emergency, hit this button. Uh, so what they would like to do is for De Jong to leave, 
and perhaps for a few other players to take wage cuts in order for them to fit in the likes of Lewandowski, Rafinha, Kunde, who are all, according to Laporta, taking wage sacrifices in order to find their love for Barcelona. Um, just in, in terms of, like you're saying, obviously, there's this payment that, he, that he's you know, not willing to walk away from and there's still a discussion going on as, what, does he actually want to come to Manchester United? My argument with that is, if he doesn't want to come to United, if he's not interested, wh why are these negotiations even going on? Why are we not just walked away from that? Is there some part of, of De Jong that would be happy to come to United if this was sorted? I'd be very, very surprised if... I mean, it will be... It will be a, a, a transfer fallacy that beats the summer of Cruz and Fabregas and ending up with Fellaini if this doesn't happen now. Um, because there has to have been emotion there from De Jong or from his agents or from someone. I mean, they've been in meetings with his agents when they signed Malasia. They have the same agent, so they have to know what the situation is. I would be, it would be absolutely lunacy not to ask about the situation about Frankie De Jong and if he'd actually be interested in coming when you're doing a deal for another player. So I think that De Jong is not opposed to going to Manchester United, but I don't think that he's necessarily pushing for it because obviously once he starts pushing, Barcelona can say, well, you're breaking the contract in, in the fact that you're not showing loyalty. This is also why I think that the message from De Jong's camp is that he's not interested in leaving because they know that he's earned money. So as long as De Jong is not doing anything, he can still point to his contract and say, well, you owe me all this money. You owe me all of these things. I don't have to do anything. I can, I can sit here. Fine, I can be on the bench for a season. You still owe me this amount of money. And what is often forgotten, I suppose, by a lot of people when you're talking about contracts is that there are loyalty clauses. So every season that goes by, his wages go up because he's signed a, a, probably a loyalty clause. This happens in most contracts in football, that after a set amount of time, you're set to earn this and this amount of money, either in a single payment or that your wages go up. The problem is that this doesn't fit into the structure that Barcelona are now setting themselves because they are dealing financially and economically on a different basis than they were in 2018, 2019 when they signed De Jong. So this is, this is where the, the breach happens. There are two boards here in which one board has signed De Jong and the second board has to deal with De Jong. And De Jong seemingly is not interested in leaving because obviously he likes Barcelona. He likes being paid by Barcelona. And if there's a, if there's a project going on with the likes of Rafinha, with the likes of Lewandowski, of course he'd like to be part of that project. But he doesn't want to be part of that project seemingly on the basis of him giving up money. What do you think? Do you expect to see? <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, but you've explained that really well, and I get that there's so many different variables yeah. here that it's almost impossible to say for definite what's going to happen, but what's your gut tell you? Do you expect to see Frankie de Jong in a Manchester United shirt by the end of the transfer window? Yeah, just to say that first, I mean, if, if anyone needs to know anything more about the situation, I'll try to explain it on Twitter or whatever it is, because this is so, it's difficult because there's so many things and so many details here that keeps changing overnight seemingly. Um, I've gone on record and I said that I'd be more surprised if Frankie de Jong plays for Barcelona than Manchester United next season. And, and I'm going to stick with that. But I think that as we're getting closer to deadline, I think that Barcelona are start going to, they're going to investigate different types of deals. I wouldn't be surprised if, for example, there's a loan deal. If he goes to Manchester United with a buy option, that kind of frees Barcelona. If United take his salary, that frees up the wage bill for Barcelona. He could go to Manchester United for a season and his dream of playing for Barcelona is not over because obviously he could go back to Barcelona. Man United would obviously, I, I would imagine they would, they would uh, discuss a, a buy option on him. But I think those types of deals will become at least viewed more as an option as time goes by unless parts are, are finding a, a, a concrete and conclusive agreement. I didn't even think of that. A low move. Imagine that one. Eh? That would be a, a big surprise and that could actually work. Makes a lot of sense. Um, moving on from Jong, which I'm sure we all want to do eventually. Um, Sesco is a name that suddenly comes to the front of the latest Manchester United reports. Is there any truth to these rumours that he could be heading to Old Trafford? It's, it's difficult because there's so... I mean, a lot of the reports that you're reading on him is obviously from uh, local media and where he plays in the country that he's from, which is always something that I find interesting because then I guess it means that there is something in there. And I believe it's the, it's the Manchester Evening News that have said that John Murtaugh has met with his agent. From what I understand in speaking to someone who's, who would know about the situation, I was told that there's a very delicate situation at this time. So I would think that there's something in it, at least that there's a sense of interest. One doesn't know if that interest means that United are going all out for him or if it's United just checking on the situation. But when someone says it's a delicate situation, to me anyways, listening to that, I would, I would at least, I would, note, I would keep notice of that one. I would, I would start viewing the YouTube compilations. That's basically what I'd do. 
uh, and try to, to get some. But I mean, he's a for any player that's played football manager, he, you know, of course, you're interested in, in, in seeing him go to a bigger club. And obviously, if that club is Manchester United, then, then even more so being interested. So I think it's I think it's one to view. I think it's one to be at least keep keep note of. Is it still worth keeping note of the Anthony situation? Because that's one that seems to fluctuate. And then you hear these quite frankly OTT price tags of like 100 million euros or whatever getting thrown about I know some of them aren't exactly accurate yeah. but do you think there's anything there or do you think that it, that's not going to happen I mean is Ajax going to sell their whole team I mean yeah it's like it just seems like Ajax is just being pilfered by everyone including yeah. Manchester United I think that says a lot about the work that Ten Hag has done though that every single team in Europe is looking at their players I mean players are going to all sorts of different clubs which I think is interesting um Anthony is a huge talent, but I mean, if that's the price being quoted, 80 million euros, 100 million euros, I mean, I think that getting, what is it, 66 million euros they got for Lissandro Martinez? Something around that, yeah, yeah. I think that's a great deal for Ajax. I think it's a great deal for Man United as well, don't get me wrong, but I think it's a great deal for a club that's viewed at a, at a I suppose, a league or, or a level lower than Manchester United to get that sort of price for a player that has had one, maybe one and a half really, really good seasons. Uh, who's going to be in the World Cup squad for Argentina, of course, but still, that's a huge price to, to get from a player. And obviously, that's going to be the the basement for where they're going to start talking about Anthony, who's obviously a, a, an offensive player who can, you know, create the difference uh, further up in the pitch for Manchester United. But I, I, I'm, I'd be surprised if, if... I think Ajax is doing that in order to, you know, fend, fend away interest. But I think that if Ronaldo leaves, then obviously United might become a little bit more desperate to find a, find a replacement. And they've seen... I mean, we're going back to the young, but they've... They've kept going back to the young all the time, so it seems like they're they're able to play the long game for players that they might be interested in. So there might be a long-standing interest in in a type like Anthony in the event that Cristiano Ronaldo should leave. Do you think Ronaldo is going to leave just on him quickly? Because I mean, we've just been sat in my, near my hotel and the Atletico team were going yeah. we were there, and uh, Diego Simeone he's been linked with Atletico. I don't think that's going to happen. Do you think he's going to leave this summer? Such a difficult one. I mean, it, it, put you on the spot. I mean, yeah. it is a difficult one. Yeah. I don't expect you to have all the answers. What's your sort of good say? Uh, in in Spanish, you'd say that I will be mojarme, which is basically you're you're uh, you're making yourself wet by obviously going into the water and saying something yes or no in, in terms of a player. But is there any way back now? I mean, is, is, I mean the way that that they keep doing this, it just seems like Ronaldo is pushing for a move. But I but what I would say is that. If Ronaldo's ever going to find motivation to deliver for Manchester United, it's now. He's, be, he's being rejected by almost every single club that he tries to go to. I mean, Bayern Munich have said no. Oliver Kahn has gone out and said that they're, they're not going to do the deal. Uh, Marca reported that Real Madrid have refused the chance to bring him back. Atletico Madrid are saying that they're not going to bring him back. Uh, who else? Chelsea are saying no. Uh, PSG have said no, apparently. So every single club that he'd like to go to are refusing him. So if you're ever going to, you know tell people that you know, remind them of who he is and remind them of the great player that he is I mean why not stay at Manchester United and stick it out but I think that his his obsession I should say his 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 maniacal obsession almost with the Champions League and records and winning all sorts of individual awards I think drives him to want to leave Manchester United because in order to gain those records and gain those awards he has to go to, play, uh, to a club that plays in the Champions League so Again, I, I mean, I wouldn't like to be Eric Ten Hag at the moment because you have, on one end, you have Frankie de Jong that you're trying to sign, that you're not able to sign because of all these things that we've already spoken about. And then you have maybe the greatest player of all time wanting to leave your club. So you're in, you're in the middle of the two biggest transfer sagas in world football at the moment. And this is your first season as Manchester United manager. I've been in the job about two months or whatever there it is. Go. He's already got there two go. massive headaches. There you go. So, I mean, and you're trying to make a team uh, compete with the likes of Manchester City and Liverpool who are, well, they are the, the best clubs in England at the moment, but they're also the biggest rivals of the club that you're trying to raise again. So, I mean, you're, you're sat in, you're, you're basically walked into the Lions then being the Manchester United manager at, the, at this moment. So... I mean, roll on the season for Manchester United. I think the only way you can forget about this is actually winning matches. Um, just on that front, finally, um, we have, as you mentioned there, we signed Martinez, we signed Malassia, we signed Christian Eriksen. Yeah. Good signings, I'm happy with all those, but, you know, City and Liverpool finished way ahead of us last season. There's still a lot of work to be done. Chelsea have spent money, Arsenal have spent money. So far, what have you made of United's transfer business and do we need to do more if we are going to challenge? I don't think United are going to challenge this season. I think that uh, I think this season needs to be a season in which they find their own style, find their own philosophy, and, and allow Ten Hag to work. I think that 
the the ambition the ambition for Manchester United should always be to win titles, of course. But say they win the FA Cup or the League Cup and, and get top four, I think that would be a huge success. I think that the goal needs to be to get back into the Champions League. Um, I mean, you you guys are in the country of Holland, so I mean. It's difficult to, to say anything against Erling Brad Holland and, and Manchester City considering the fact that we were in Norway and considering the fact that he might be the best player in the Premier League at the moment. So I think that City are going to win the league and I think that Liverpool are going to be neck and neck with them, unfortunately, for any, anyone who loves Manchester United. But I think Manchester United are going to finish top four based upon the fact that the squad that they have have been underperforming to such a degree that it's almost a little bit embarrassing for the, for the previous managers, I think. And that's even including our own Ole Gunnar who was there. I think that he did well, but at the same time, when you look at the likes of Sancho, Rashford, Martial, I even, I even, I'm one of the few perhaps that rate Fred and McTominay. I kind of like the way that they, once they're played in the correct system, I think that they're able to mesh and, and create a, a nucleus in midfield that, that allows players like Fernandes to not really do any defensive work. I like the pickup of Christian Eriksen. I really like that one because you're getting someone with experience, with proven quality, and I mean, if, you, if you're going to look at it from an economical point of view, it's, he's, he's for free. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great player and it's someone who goes into that Mata role of being a leader in the dressing room and at least showing the young players how, to, how it's done, I suppose. So, I like United's transfer business and I do think that if you get someone in midfield, the likes of De Jong, maybe an attacker, the likes of Sheshko, and you're able to sort of find out that this Cristiano Ronaldo conundrum, I'd expect them to get top four. Top four, I think there's most United fans, well, certainly I would I would take that at the minute. Jonas, it's always great chatting to you. Uh, make sure you go and check out Jonas's work. There's a link in the description as well to his La Liga uh, podcast as well. Always in Norwegian, rather. That has to be said. It, has, it is in Norwegian. So if you're an Englishman and want to listen to this, I do apologise. But if you leave my Twitter, you can ask me all the sorts of questions in there. Listen, so. most English people speak Norwegian anyway. Don't worry, it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, but it's in Norwegian anyway. So make sure you check that out if, you're, if you do speak Norwegian. Um, Jonas, it's always great chatting to you. Hopefully, next time we talk, we'll have done the Frankie de Jong deal. Ronaldo have stayed and, and everything will be happy. Eric Ten Hag's life will be a lot easier. This has been a one-on-one -on -one interview with Jonas Gavier. Make sure you are liking, subscribing and sharing on the channel as well. Check out all the other videos we've done on the tour. We've spoken to Jamie Jackson, Rob Dawson, Laurie Whitwell. Um, we've spoken to loads of different people. So make sure you're checking those videos out. Thanks for watching.